the world. This planet is full of people, several billion people, on the uh, order of about nine, approaching 10 billion people. And there is much talk about artificial intelligence taking over and causing people to lose their jobs and industries destroyed and all of this that you hear about when it comes to the future of work, the future of economies, and the future of making a living and getting by in this world. And so when we talk about population, right, the data about population exists in a variety of forms. Today, I'm going to look at population data that's in the form of a PDF file, a PDF file. So this discussion is about artificial intelligence and software development, and it seems rather long, but it illustrates a point. And that is that programmers, the way that we understand programming is not going away, and there is real evidence to show that the skills that one develops in software development is going to be even more valuable as these AI tools get pushed out. So this entire discussion actually came about somewhat organically. It wasn't planned. And I actually had a reason to process PDFs somewhat recently. I'd say about a few weeks ago. I needed to process PDFs and I needed it needed to do it in a way where I needed to get the PDFs into a database. I needed to get the information out of a PDF into a database. And so what was going to be the best way to do that? Well, writing a computer program. Now, I'm sure there's AI out there that could do that. And I'm sure if you paid a good enough fee on that, you could probably get that accomplished in a few minutes. However, this was a situation where I did not have access to those tools if they do exist and I had a very limited amount of time to accomplish my task and I needed to accomplish that task in a very high quality way. So this is not a toy example, this is a real example. The thing is, is that there's all kinds of ways to process PDFs and one of them is XPDF. XPDF consists of a viewer. It can, it's an alternative to Adobe Acrobat. You can view PDFs with it. And it also has some tools behind the scenes that can extract the text out of a PDF file. Now, this particular uh, tool, XPDF, did have an exploit way back when, but the creators of this tool assures us that those exploits have been dealt with. So I decided to use XPDF. And one of the reasons why I wanted to use XPDF is because it originates out of the Linux environment. So you can get it very easily in Linux. And the example that I show here, I'm showing it in Microsoft Windows because most people will relate to Microsoft Windows quite easily. And so the file menus and everything else won't feel or seem so foreign or different. However, everything that I do here can be done in the Linux environment. Anyway, I wanted the tools for XPDF. I wasn't interested in the reader because I wanted the tool called PDF to Text. It's a program that's part of this tool set. And what it does is it allows you to Point it at a PDF file and out comes some text. And once you have text, you can then write computer code that can process the text, manipulate it, transform it, and do whatever you want to, including import it into a database, um, do in depth queries, calculations on it, you name it. And while I was doing this, I said, you know, this will be a good good time to add 7-Zip. 
I know you got zip capabilities built into Windows 11, but and they're fine, but I actually like 7-Zip. I've used it way before when Microsoft decided to integrate Zip into Windows, and I still like to use it because I feel that there is much more effort that has been put into uh, 7-Zip, so the code is of a higher quality and a higher nature. And I know that the upcoming updates to Windows 11 is going to bring uh, tar extraction into the fold, and that's cool and all, but I'm still going to use 7-Zip for the most part, unless I'm dealing with a Windows machine that's not my own, where I don't have the ability to put 7-Zip on there, and so I'd have to use the tool that's built into Windows. The other thing I like about 7-Zip is there are more options when you're using it in terms of how you extract, whether you extract in the immediate folder or in its own folder, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a great program. So I will continue to use it when I'm using Windows. So I've extracted the, um, the compressed uh, file containing the XPDF uh, utils or tools. And all I want is this uh, PDF to text executable. Mind you, everything that I talk about here I've already done, I've already vetted. So this is going to be very straightforward from my point of view in terms of relating how this process works. So I'm gonna copy this PDF to text uh, program into a folder up here and I'm just going to run it. And I'm gonna take my example uh, PDF that I downloaded, the world population data for 2023 and I'm going to run it through PDF to text so that I could generate some text. The first time that I did this, I was like, you know, this is a very interesting program for what it does. Also, when I opened this PDF, I noticed something. One of the things that I noticed was that the page numbering was a little bit weird. So page one is actually uh, page A, the capital letter A. And page two is showing as page one and so on and so forth. I've noticed over the years that PDFs can be very weird like that. They can be quite weird like that. Some PDFs, they get encoded in such a way where the page you see on the screen doesn't seem to match the page that is in the PDF file that's encoded inside the PDF's metadata. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm going to run this program, PDF to text. And these are the values that you, um, you provide with the, um, the program PDF to text. These are command flags. And so in this case, I'm going to use the flag uh, dash table. So if the PDF has data in it, that's essentially arranged like a table, then this flag will cause the PDF to text program to recognize that regularity and information and output a text file that matches it. So I like that idea of being able to recognize table like data inside of a PDF file and create the equivalent of it in a text file. If that seems uh, somewhat far off or something that is not real clear, it will be clear once I run this program against this PDF file and we see the result. We see the output. So I just ran the program. It just went just like that so quick. And there's the file and it's a text file. I, on Windows, I prefer to use Notepad++, and so I'm going to use Notepad++ to examine the file. Notepad++ has many features that I like. One of them is the ability to show characters, show the, the um, invisible characters in a file, right? Such as what do spaces look like, what do tabs look like, what are line returns look like. And so that's what I'm visualizing here. So I can get a sense of 
what this file looks like and what we're dealing with when it comes to writing programming code against this information. So I'm going to use Microsoft Visual Studio. And in this uh, particular case, I'm going to write a program or put a program together that is going to do a couple of things. First, it's going to take that PDF to text program and it's going to call it. It's going to use it. So it's going to identify PDF files, right? So this program is going to identify PDF files and each PDF file, it's going to send it through this PDF to text program. So I'm going to have, a, have my program, which is a program, calling another program, right? So a program calling a program. And so it's going to send this uh, other program, PDF to text, a, a PDF file. And PDF to text is going to create a text file that has the PDF information extracted out. And then this program that I'm writing, it's going to then take that text file and it's going to translate it so that instead of spaces between each column of information, we'll have a tab character. We'll have a single tab. I'm going to call this program File Tabifier. I'm going to call it File Tabifier. So tabs are a preferred way to separate out columns of information in a text file. It's one of the preferred ways. It's very similar to um, a CSV file. Uh, CSV is more widely known by, uh, by many people. Uh, commas, it stands for comma separated values. So comma separated values is where you have all your, co all your columns separated by commas. And then the column data itself is within double quotes. So that's the official definition of comma separated values. I, I prefer to use tabs because tabs result in less data in the file. The, the files uh, can be smaller. By the way, uh, here are the specs of the computer I'm running this on. Basically, it's a Pentium processor um, from about 2018 or 2019 and 4 gigabytes of RAM and a uh, 500 gigabyte SSD. It didn't originally come with that. Um, you can watch my older videos for you know a description of the machine anyway so that's where we are with this is we have a program in Microsoft Visual Studio 2022 using the C-sharp programming language and I'm going to um, set up this process where I'm going to have PDF to text as part of the program itself. So I just copy and paste PDF to text uh, the program into Visual Studio. Not now. We, we don't need to comment about what I think about Visual Studio. Uh, thank you. And so I'm going to set the uh, properties to uh, always copy the PDF to text uh, program to the output directory where my program is compiled uh, into. So that's going to be very helpful in this process. And um, let me introduce you uh, who don't know. That's my niece. Uh, her name is Andy. And um, she is uh, uh, looking for mommy, um, uh, my sister, Brooke. <laughs> so, um, and um, what I want to do here is... Um, go in and make a few changes to the default uh, settings in Visual Studio for this project, right? So what I've been experimenting with and what I would prefer to do when it comes to these types of projects using Visual Studio is to use the architecture that I know the program is going to be deployed to. So here recently I've, I've decided to just go ahead and use the target OS and the change the actual platform right to uh, to some specific preferences because it has not been true in my experience where I take a .NET program executable and I copy and paste it from a Intel AMD based machine onto an ARM based machine 
I know that's going to become a thing here in the near future, but that's not something I would even advise doing. I think optimiz upfront optimization is a better blueprint, a better plan. So the intermediate language that's generated in Visual Studio w would be of a higher quality, is of a higher quality, when you make those decisions on platform and CPU hardware, that sort of thing. You make those decisions up front, you get a, a much better program. So I decided to build this at this stage so I could clean out the old directory in the output um, where, where the program is output because I just don't want that there in any shape, form, or fashion. It's just a good habit to stay clean at all times as much as possible. So I'm going to clear all that out, and which is what I've done, and now i got a new output directory that signifies the platform and architecture. So that's cool. I got PDF to text there, and I got the initial version of the executable, the program that I am putting together here, a file Tabifier. Awesome. So far, so good. So the next thing to do is to build out the skeleton of this program. And so since I've already built this program, actually I've built a more complicated version of this program. As in, there, there's um, multiple um, programs that work together, kind of like a swarm in a pipeline. And this, what I'm going to put here, is a simpler, simplified um, version of what I've uh, actually built here recently. And so, <clears throat> what I want to do is take command line arguments, right? Because uh, gone are the days, or should be gone are the days, where we hard code even test values into the program. You know, in the earlier days of .NET, you could hard code in like file paths and all that kind of stuff. And it's still cool to do that, right? Let's not be so prudish and, um, and, and so technically snob, snobbish to say that that's not a cool thing to do. But what I'm saying is there are simply um, more streamlined ways to do this that allows the program to um, be more ready for production, more production ready from the get-go. And passing in command line arguments to the executable or having the ability to set the command line arguments in Visual Studio in the project so when you run it through the debugger is a much smoother process. And I dare say that it works better than what we used to use, which was, um, you know, um, app.config or config files, right? And so, and app.config is still a thing. It's just um, from my own observations, it has been de-emphasized, right? But that's cool. I'm not missing it. Uh, this here is a really good way, and this is more in alignment with the way we do it in Linux anyway. This is more in alignment with the way we do it in Linux and Unix anyway. So Microsoft, through their modifications and their, their evolution of their tools, is sliding more in that Linux direction um, anyway. And since Linux is my preferred platform, it's my chief flagship platform, um, I'm right at home with doing it this way. So I'm actually glad that Microsoft is shifting in a Linux, Unix way of doing things. Although I, I do predict that probably five or 10 years from now, those that are still developing in the Windows environment probably won't even know that. You know, there, there's there's some things developing where you might not even know that, but that's cool. So, um, but so I got this uh, function called uh, interpret console parameters, right? And so all it's gonna do is it's gonna take in the arguments from the command line and it's going to uh, pull out the individual arguments and make them sensible and meaningful to the program, right? So that's what this process is here. It's a very simple way to do, do this. There are 
dozens of ways to do this, as you all know, right? There are dozens of ways to do this. I chose to do it this way because I just felt like doing it this way, right? I just felt like doing it this way. Well, maybe feeling is not really the right right term here. This was simply very straightforward and it uh, matched the realities of what I'm dealing with in terms of the the environment in which I'm writing these programs, right? Which is you don't need an extensive, intricate command line argument parsing um, tool or utility. Though I may um, establish one or or you know use one at some point, but my focus has generally been in the meet the core of the solution <coughs> and um, not so much on the trimmings in this particular case. So, so anyway, um, but I'm expecting a certain number, minimum number of arguments. So that's the approach I take here is that it doesn't matter how many command line arguments someone passes into this program. What matters is that there are at least as many command line arguments as the program needs in order to successfully run. So, in this particular case, we're talking about uh, four values, right? So, two flags, each with uh, a single value. So, um, so four parameters all together, and that's what this establishes. So, when I go through and I process this with a switch statement, right, I'm looking for the presence of those command line arguments. In this case, the PDF directory and the output directory. So, I don't know how common this is, but typically when I see a command line program, it will take in a file path, an actual file path and not a directory path. In the way that I'm doing this, it's, it seems to me that it's typically done with a file path as the input, and you can have a directory as the output or a file path as an output as well. And I did start out doing that, but I just had a mental shift at some point where it was like, you know, I can actually make programs like this much more useful and flexible, much more useful and flexible if I use directory paths instead of file paths. Basically, it makes the program more scalable, right? So I can say, so instead of having to write a batch script that tries to uh, feed a, a executable, a single file path mirrored to a output path, why not just let the program itself handle the directory, handle the files in the directory? And then you can add validations with that to constrain the access to a given directory. This program here doesn't put those type of constraints on it. And since I'm the only person using it, then, you know, it's like you don't need those constraints at this time, right? But what you would do is just have rules around, let's say, file naming, um, file, file naming conventions. You would have rules around potentially the contents and the nature of the file. Uh, one constraint I do put in here is um, I deal with file extensions. And I found that to be um, very suitable uh, for this process. And um, so I have some initial validations that I want in this particular process. I want to make sure that the um, directories actually are valid, that they exist. I don't want any fake directories passed in. They have to be real directories, real folders, 
on the storage device uh, on the computer. And so this is going to validate that the storage devices are correct, that the storage devices are real. Or rather, the, the, fo the folder and file paths are real. And if they're not, there will be a diagnostic message that is presented um, during the running of this program. If we find that the folder paths are real folder paths, then we will preemptively create those folders so that we eliminate a, a failure uh, path in the program. We just go ahead and outright uh, eliminate it. So programs can <clears throat> manipulate the environment around them, the computing environment around them. So there are ways of doing that <clears throat> such that you're setting up the conditions for the program so that it can run more successfully, run more optimally, right? And that's something that I developed, I would say, uh, for my own uh, development approach in the early uh, 2000s, <clears throat> which is to create essentially a operational moat around a program is what I call it. <clears throat> I create an operational moat. And basically what that means is instead of doing validations at every single level of the program, if you know the operating conditions around the program are of a particular um, level, then there are ways you can simplify the definition of the program that's going to allow that program to run more optimally. So I know that there are um, arguments against that, and that's fine. But I found that um, to actually hold up in the real world, in numerous real world conditions that I've been at, and multiple companies that I've implemented entire systems. And so um, my whitelisting approach and moats approach uh, works very well in the real world in terms of um, programs that run on servers or where you have desktop deployments that um, have very uh, rigorous um, definitions established by the IT department. So anyway, I have my validation um, put in place and it's um, moving along quite well um, in terms of um, the code and the pace of the code. <clears throat> and this is where we want to put in the actual sequence for the program, right? We do it in the main function here. And so once we know that the prerequisites for the program are, are uh, set, and verified, then we can move on to accepting the data as is and using it to accomplish tasks. The first task that we want to accomplish is we want to get a list of all the PDF files in the directory that's been passed into the program. So once we have all the PDF files, then we can um, essentially take each PDF file one at a time and process it through PDF to text. And then we'll get a corresponding text file that mirrors the contents of the input PDF file, but in a form that the program can manipulate as text in a very straightforward way. So that's what's occurring here. That's what's taking place here. And I know stylistically in C Sharp and in .NET, we can approach this a different way, but I'm approaching it the way that I am here for a very particular reason. And this reason is sound for me at least. So I'm using explicit code rather than some of the sophistications that are now possible in .NET and C Sharp. Because I want the code that I write to be source portable to different languages, 
to different languages of the same type. So let's expound on that more as I flesh out the definition of this function. And I'm going to repeat what I'm saying here a couple of times in this discussion. But starting out, I want the code that I write here to be applicable not just to Windows, but to Linux. And you can um, use C-sharp in Linux. I've done it before. I did it way before we had um, .NET Core. I did it when we had Mono, right? Mono still exists, but nobody really uses it anymore. But anyway, so, but what I'm talking about is not that. I'm not talking about taking the C-sharp source code copying and pasting it or, you know, downloading it, cloning it from a, a Git repository into a Linux environment and then just compiling it with the command line .NET SDK that's now available in Linux. That's cool, and I like that. What I'm talking about is when I've written some code and it's a good sequence of code and I'm able to replicate that in a different language like Java. Let's say I wanted to use Java. I just wanted to do my solution in Java for whatever reason. And the syntax is, is generally similar. It's not exactly the, precisely the same, but they're close. So close that all I have to do is make a few tweaks and I can copy and paste that code into a Java solution and run it. I can copy and paste that code into a C++ solution and run it. I can copy and paste that code into a Kotlin solution. And let's go just a little stretch. This is probably too far of a stretch, but even um, the language Go from Google, I can copy and paste it into a Go solution or something that's more realistic, even Rust. So you see where I'm going here is that you can design your solution in such a way where if you need to briefly or substantially and sustainably re-implement in a different but similar language, you can do so. You can do so. And you're not tied down to just this platform here that you see. You're not tied into it because there are legitimate reasons to re-implement in the languages that are first-party languages or even um, more established languages in other platforms, right? C Sharp is not an established language. It's not a it's not a substantive language for Linux or Apple's Mac OS environments. It's not. If I wanted to use Apple Swift language, which is somewhat similar. Um, it's not hugely, but it, there's close enough in syntax, right? If I wanted to do that, I could do that with this approach. I can't do that if I go hardcore all in on syntactic sugar, right? So I'm going to stop talking because on that subject there because I'm getting to the point where we're making enough progress. We need to uh, keep up with the context here. So... Um, I have um, the overall skeleton established here, and it's looking good. Um, it, I am going through the different PDF files, and I have a process that I will launch, right? So the PDF to text is going to be the process that I launch. I'm going to pass in the actual uh, path to a PDF file to PDF to text. And... It's going to produce a output file in text format, and the name of the file is going to be the file name that I've chosen for this process for the, for that for that uh, particular PDF file. So I went ahead and deleted that because I don't need that there anymore. So let's just go ahead and stay clean. And I want to take a look at. Um, uh, a few things um, before we get started. So let's see here. <laughs> so 
let's build a solution and let's uh, make sure that Visual Studio is good to go with that. I also like to build before running it because um, I've noticed that with Visual Studio, um, having it do multiple things on the way to launching the program through Visual Studio um, sometimes can cause it to get snagged up. It's rare that it happens, but it does happen. So when you build, it makes sure everything's saved and everything's in place so it's easier for the debugger uh, process to actually launch. So um, let's just take a look at this and see what we got. Um, yes, everything is, um, you know, there we got the PDF to text program and we got the main executable. So <clears throat> if I, when I launch this program, right, um, then without command line arguments, it just exits uh, right away. So Visual Studio is passing in the, um, the required command line arguments to get this program um, up and running and uh, executing what needs to be executed. And what I'm looking for is an output file from this process. And um, let's see. So the debug uh, process um, has ran. The Visual Studio uh, invocation process has ran. And it doesn't take very long. There's not very much going on here uh, in terms of uh, processing. Um, even more so that it didn't have any input to process, right? So, um, so we need to put the PDF files in the right directory. It, I, the program, when it launched, it created the directory that was needed. But in real-world uh, instances, you would already have that directory uh, created. And so, um, it's a small subset of the PDF file that we're processing here. Page three is our, our goal. We just want to process page three. Um, out of all the pages in that PDF, we just, we singled out page three. So there's the output file. So the program has succeeded on the first run. So that's good. And this is what it looks, that's what it looked like. Um, you know, so uh, we'll have um, we'll have all of our spaces between the columns, and um, the goal is to um, put uh, take all of those extra spaces and turn it into tabs. And don't worry, there will be ample time during this discussion to explain tabs. I did a summary earlier, but I will go in a little more depth uh, here uh, in a bit. So. Now that we have um, the, the initial part of this process where it's able to um, use PDF to text to generate a text version of this file, now what we're looking for is um, the, the second part of this, which is to transform, translate that text information uh, from spaces to tabs. And while I'm sitting here talking about this, I just realized something. I just realized something. I have used utilities like this in the past, way in the past. And I just never thought for the life of me that I would make something like this. But, but anyway, I, I have reasons for that. And the, the utilities I'm talking about, they're, they're not like this, but they were built into some other program. It's like you could bring in some text and you could have it convert some stuff. But um, that was long ago in some older version of Windows, I think, and an older version of a development tool or something. So um, it would take me just as long to try to find that, probably longer than it would be to build this here. So that's why I went down this course here. <clears throat> so... 
the next thing that we're looking at is um, making sure this process is stable enough to um, allow this program the opportunity to um, process the text file. Because when you use the uh, process, um, the, the, the process protocol in uh, .NET, it um, has a tendency to run asynchronously. And so by uh, having um, a, having a, um, not a mutex, but ha having the program wait uh, for the completion of the uh, process execution and optionally, optionally testing for the, uh, for the successful conclusion of that process uh, will um, allow the program to operate deterministically in a, in a very um, reliable way uh, or predictable way. We can, we can have some, some way to know when things are ready to go to the next stage rather than kind of guessing that because there's an alternative way. You can let it run asyn asynchronously and then you can spin up another asynchronous process that then uh, polls for the existence of files of a, with, of a certain name and all of that. And I've done all that before. That is valid for certain solutions. It's just not useful here. It, it, you don't gain a real benefit here um, doing that. So... Um, that's why I opted to um, um, I apologize for that. Apparently I had misplaced my earpods. By the way, I prefer earpods over earpods, just RF frequency, radio, you know whatever. But suffice to say, I definitely like uh, doing it this way in terms of waiting for the process to exit because it's very reliable and it is um, very straightforward. So what we got um, at this stage is a program that takes in a PDF file, outputs the text, and there is um, no real issues with that. So I want to take this moment to uh, clean some things up. If you press control period, you can start uh, refactoring processes. So if I rename that uh, variable or the, uh, rename a function, control period starts that and you just press enter. You don't even have to, have to think about it, just keyboard shortcut and you're ready to go. So um, pretty cool stuff. It would be accurate to say this is truly a day in the life of a programmer, of a software developer, software engineer, whatever title you want to put on there. But this is a day in, day in the life. There is a lot of minutia, a lot of detail that has to be addressed. And so anyone who finds this um, mind-numbingly uh, boring, right, uh, just keep in mind that this is not the process for you. If, if you if you think that way, right? So, but I could talk about this all day long. So now I want to set up the process of reading in the text file. So I'm going to use a stream reader for that purpose. I like the stream reader. I like the way that API is designed. I like everything about that. I like the concept where it allows you to uh, work with file information and other types of uh, input and output information in a very efficient way, performance efficiency. So, and I like the symmetry of a stream reader and a stream writer. The symmetry of it is just so beautiful. So I really like this stuff, right? This is just awesome. You know, to me, even after 20 years or more, right? Uh, 20, going, yeah, 20, 24 years. I've been using .NET since the year 2000, so. And 
this part of it, it uh, never gets old. But um, so anyway, I'm going to read in a line of text. Each line of text that I read in, I'm going to pass it into a function. The objective of this function is going to be to take that line of text that where the columns of data is separated by spaces and turn it into um, a line of text where the columns are separated by tabs. That's it. That's all it needs to do. But in order to do these things well in these situations, you have to set up infrastructure. You have to set up the right process, the right foundation and sequence in order to go from point A to point Z. So that's what this function is going to do. This function, this function here, tabify space delimited text is the entire discussion. And artificial intelligence is going to feature prominently here in just a little while. It's going to feature very prominently as we begin to transition this discussion into the aspects of artificial intelligence that is uh, relevant to this discussion. Here, the star of the show is ChatGPT. This is ChatGPT model 4, and later on I will use mod model 4.0. So I used, uh, this is um, a process that I had did about a week before 4.0 came out. So I'm going to redo it in 4.0 and see if there's any difference in the results. But I asked ChatGPT, I formed a query where it would um, do what we're talking about doing here. Okay, let's take a line of text that has spaces between each column and let's convert it to, um, to tabs between the columns. Preserving single spaces within words. Ah, there's a twist there. See, if this was just the mere replacement of multiple spaces or spaces in general to tabs, the first, very first suggestion that ChatGPT gave me would have been sufficient. But it is not. The code is super simple. I have also written it. There are cases where it's it's necessary. I have written this code and that's not a surprise to me anymore because chat GPT is based off of the internet and my code and millions of other programmers codes are on the internet and chat GPT has been trained on the codes that it's found on the internet. It knows the codes that programmers have talked about in blog posts in articles, in journals, even old journals that predate the internet that were converted in PDF, post-internet, and uploaded up to the internet. ChatGPT has access to all of that. And so, I'm not one to um, say to ChatGPT that it needs to not consider that, right? So give me just one second while I pause here. I really had to catch myself for a moment there. I was going on a very wild tangent. So, all right. So a thing about this is um, we have tabs between um, the columns, but the problem is, is that it overdid it. This, this, the particular recommended solution here, it overdoes it because there are some spaces that has to be preserved. Some spaces that have to be preserved. So if I have a, a, um, a line of text and there, there are spaces in the text or there's a space between words, then that needs to be preserved. 
right? So our objective here are, is columns, not necessarily spaces. It's that we want the representation of columns to, uh, to be preserved, as well as the words and content itself. So I, I took the blame on this. I always take the blame in these because ChatGPT is like what we say about a classical program. It does exactly what the programmer asks it to do. So ChatGPT does what you ask it to do. I felt I gave it a sufficient specification, but perhaps I needed to be more clear in my specification to ChatGPT. So let's give it another chance. I told it about the spaces. It has adjusted accordingly. And let's see how uh, suitable this solution is. I make a few tweaks just so it uh, fits in stylistically and um, from a standard standpoint in the solution that is here. And I am grateful for case sensitivity in .NET and similar C-based languages because that's very helpful in this case. So anyway, um, let's run this and see if version 2 of this process will be sufficient uh, for our needs. I am curious to, uh, to see that, um, as I'm sure everyone else is, um, because surely we can use ChatGPT to enhance our productivity to such an extent where it is very clear that we don't need ChatGPT, or sorry, where we don't need programmers in the near future. Surely, we can have some indication of that in this process. And by the way, I hear they're working on GPT-5. They're training it. Um, that's what I hear. And I'm going to have some comments about that near the end of uh, this, this discussion. But version two, um, we just go ahead and open it in Notepad++, uh, plus plus, right? And I just want to keep up with the version so it's uh, easy to, uh, to see what we're dealing with. And, hmm, well, that looks a little better but it's just not quite where it needs to be. But it does look a little better. So this is the source data. The source data um, is, is what we're, we're uh, referencing. And I say uh, by version 2, um, ChatGPT has um, gotten us close to where we need to be. And I would also um, say that at this point, it also has us at the point where we could tweak the solution potentially and maybe uh, go, go no further, right? But there are a couple of flaws in the translation that I see here. So what I want to do is I want to uh, keep going and see if um, ChatGPT can refine um, what it has put together, right? So let's go back to the large language model and uh, see what um, what improvements can be made, right? Because the objective here is to save time, really. That's the overall goal. It's not so much to replace anything. It's not about replacing programmers or any other type of uh, you know, work or anything like that. The goal is... Can we speed things up to such an extent where our costs of using a tool like this is, you know, it, we have a return on investment. We have, we have real benefits here, right? Where the costs prove beneficial. So I'm trying version three of this process and... Just got to make sure the variable <coughs> names are synced up. Um, very uh, easy, quick tweak. So 
um, version two got us close. Surely version three is going to uh, nail it, right? Because you're just so close. You're, you're like one tweak away from making this the solution that a person needs to where I don't need to write anything, really, right? And there's our version three output. <coughs> let's um, make a version three folder, put all the contents there, and let's examine this and see what this looks like. Because we are all curious about this. All right, so I'm looking at it and I already see some major flaws, but um, that's okay. Um, yeah, there's um, there's uh, definitely um, some regression here that has taken place. We've gone backwards in terms of the quality of the result, right? And I just want to say it like this. We're spending, we're, we're, we're essentially spending too much time tweaking chat GPT. We're, we're spending too much time trying to obtain the result that we're looking for, right? And the amount of time that we're putting into this is roughly equivalent to the amount of time it would take for a software developer to do this without the use of chat GPT. We're, we're roughly spending the same amount of time at this stage. It's like pair programming in the agile methodology, right? How much time is that second programmer who's watching the other, other one how much time is that second programmer actually spending that's actually productive use of time, right? Because sometimes two heads are better than one, but two heads are not better than one when you're talking about eight hours of work where both are getting paid the same, but only one is producing output. And that is a gross exaggeration, a gross exaggeration, because because it's not always like that, but sometimes it is. And so... Here, we just want to um, light it up with a fourth version where we got much more uh, specific with uh, ChatGPT. And when I say specific, we've elevated the level of verbosity. We've become more verbose in our language and in our approach to chat GPT, right? To our approach to this tool. And in this entire discussion, I am using the language of anthropomorphism. I'm anthropomorphizing this tool. I really am. Because it's easier for a human to do that. It's easy for us to give personality, to say that this tool has a personality. I'm talking about it as if it is something that has intelligence. <clears throat> because as a living being myself, that's what I actually deal with. I deal with other living beings, right? And those other living beings have intelligence. And this tool that I'm using, ChatGPT, has been marketed as and has indications to suggest in terms of how it reacts to your input as if there is a human being there. But we know that there isn't. Uh, this result here, by the way, is even worse than um, the previous one. And maybe it's the worst result so far, but I think that's an exaggeration. I'm not maintaining sufficient short-term memory um, to even remember where we are at this point with the regressions and with the declining... But what I can remember is from this conversation, I then tried to give ChatGPT a human-based hint. This is this text you see here with these codes. Um, 
I tried to give ChatGPT an actual algorithmic design that I was working out on paper. So I had already worked out my own solution on paper. But I decided to consult ChatGPT initially because I was like, do I really want to write this? Do I really want to write this code? I don't mind writing this code, but, you know, I was like, can I save some time here with ChatGPT? Wouldn't that be cool to actually save some time? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. It would be nice to save some time. But it's not actually worthwhile if, if the time you're spending becomes what the business world calls an opportunity cost. You pay an opportunity uh, price, right? And that is you've missed out on an opportunity that you could have um, derived benefit from if you were able to transact the business the right way or even attempted to transact the business. You would have derived certain benefits but if you were not even in the game, if you were not even in the right zone and in the right way, then you miss out on that business altogether. You just, it just you miss it. It's okay. So you've missed the opportunity and somebody else got the prize. And that's what happens with the artificial intelligence or what they call artificial intelligence is that you spend a lot of time missing the prize, and that, that prize is the amount of time you could have poured into your own effort to develop this at a certain level, right? Because what's you, what, what is the use of a tool like this for naive implementations of code, right? When your actual objective is to advance, you're trying to put together an advanced solution. You're, you need the ability to work through the intricacies of software development, of software um, specification and implementation. You need the ability to work through that implementation detail and do it at an increasingly refined level of mastery and craft. And... If you have a tool like this that is able to deal at the level of the beginner or the intermediate, then you really don't get to the point where you cross over into the advanced to actually innovate. And so, anyway, um, we're on another version here. And... This one actually looks a little more promising, I must say. In fact, I think in all my tests, <coughs> this was the version that actually um, accomplished the goal, except there was one problem. And let's see if I can remember what that was. But um, this, this uh, solution here um, is much more promising. So what's interesting about this, this process of working through these different um, uh, solutions to the same problem, these different solutions to the same problem, we're on version six. Wow. And version six came the closest um, to solving this, right? But it didn't really solve it. <laughs> I now remember what it was. The reason why I didn't solve it is because while it handled the overall specification correctly, it, it missed one key detail. I don't need a first column of empty data. The first column is, so it, put, it started each line with a tab. To say it in a simpler way, it put a tab in, it left the tab in, in, in the beginning of each line. And we don't need that. We need each line to start out with data. Or we need each, we need the first column to be a column that has data in it. Right? 
because in the majority of cases, that's what you're going to have. So, so there's a, that's a failure mode there. And that's fine. So now it's time to um, transition into the solution that I came up with. And I'm proud of this solution, not because, not, not because AI couldn't do it. That's not why I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it because of the journey I had to take in order to derive it, in order to derive the solution. It was a real journey for me. And so I'm going to unveil this here. Um, I'm going to recreate it, right? And so I start out with a couple of variables. So <clears throat> these variables are going to keep up with the positions of space and letters. It's a somewhat, in my uh, view, it's a somewhat temporal uh, solution. It's based off of time and distance. It's based off of time and distance. So the way I solve this is I don't solve it like a computer. I solve this by looking at the data, right? So I study the type of data that PDF to text generates, right? I look at the result. And in my mind, in my, my, the way I can process the information I can see how you can solve this. I can see the sequences, sequence of text, the sequence of spaces. And like any of us, you learn visually, right? The majority of us, the majority of humans, I believe, learn visually. Don't, the majority of us, we don't learn through textbooks. That's not how we evolved. We didn't evolve to grow through um, a reading of the encyclopedia and all this kind of stuff. We are visual. We're hands-on. We are we're able to deal with things in a three-dimensional, four-dimensional way. And then the, there's the rare ones that um, can actually articulate a five-dimensional, right? I don't know if I'm there yet, but but in terms of like looking at a piece of paper or looking at a, a computer screen and seeing a problem. I can just visualize it, right? But how do you take what you see as common sense? You're like, oh yeah, that's common sense. Oh, you just, all you have to do is just take all that space right there, just remove it, put a tab in it, right? You see that, but it's like, okay, how does that translate in the world of programming, the world of code? (laughs) So part of the story is um, you work on it and you fail at it. And then you think about it some more and you go to sleep and you dream about the solution. You wake up the next day and you have more insight and you're like, oh, I see. You know, something like that in some cases. In this case, that's what happened. I usually don't end up there, but sometimes I do. In my best um, implementations, I've, I've, I've done that. It just happens naturally. It's like you just go to sleep on it and you, you wake up with better insight because the subconscious and the deeper aspects of the mind and the brain are able to do things that not even a quantum computer can do. So here we are with um, you know the branching logic where I look at um, each character and I determine is it a space and I don't care if it's a non-printable character. If it's not, um, <coughs> if, if, it's, if it's a space, right, then I essentially, I essentially want to strip it out and I want to keep everything else, right? So that's what I'm doing here is I'm not so much replacing spaces, but I am um, ignoring them. But I'm ignoring them in a way where I ignore the right spaces and recognize the right spaces. So there are spaces that, like if you have a a sequence of spaces, you got like five spaces, seven spaces, eight spaces. All All that space just needs to be ignored. But you got to know where you 
are relative to where you were. That's where the distance comes in. So that's what these two variables track. And although the solutions that ChatGPT had sourced from the internet was based off of a Boolean switch, are you in a space sequence or not? Um, and I've written code like that before. Um, I don't actually like that code. I've had to deal with it in production, even though I designed it, and I didn't find it very um, accommodating long term. So I wanted something that was more compact. And that's what I uh, strove to do here is define a solution that's more compact, but that could actually achieve the, the result the same way I could achieve it if I wrote the code out in a much more uh, elaborate way, a longer form with numerous Boolean um, variables and a Boolean switching logic. And I still have Boolean switching logic, but this is a much more numerical solution than the way I would typically approach the manipulation of um, of data, of text, right? This is a little bit more numerical. In this case, because it gives me a solution that can uh, scale more easily depending on the volume of text that needs to be processed. Also, again, if I need more performance and a solution like this doesn't, doesn't actually... Um, adequately handle gigabytes of data let's say in C-sharp I can you know re-implement it very trivially in C++ and gain an order of magnitude performance improvement and then patch it into a .NET solution if, need, if I ever needed to I've never needed to do that but I have that option right and so I don't have to do as much work to evolve this long term. It can it can be written the way that it is and I can go about what I need to do. So we're now running the solution that I came up with and I already know how this goes because I made the video. But my first running of this, it failed and I was like, how could that be? Because I've already implemented this and there's no way that this is actually failing because there's always the possibility that you have corner cases, you have edge cases, you have things that you didn't think of because this isn't the same data that I tested this implementation on. This is different data. I used an entirely different type of data, different topic area for the solution, right? I used an entirely different topic area for the solution. And so, but I felt confident that I had developed something that could work on any PDF that goes through PDF to text in this fashion. And I still maintain that confidence, right? But... This is also part of the day in the life of a programmer where it's like you look at a solution that has ran into a problem and it's a solution that you have a very high degree of confidence that it's the right solution and does not need to be amended. Sometimes it does. It's a funny um uh, tale or a funny story in the world of software development where it's like, you know, I uh, kept debugging the solution and working on it to where I ended up changing so much code that I ended up with a better solution just because it failed and I kept changing it trying to fix this or fix that, thinking that this, so you end up trying to fix the wrong problems, but you end up improving the overall design of the of the solution in your attempts to do that 
And so I'm no stranger to that, but I knew that that was definitely not the case here. I just needed to run this through the debugger to see, you know, what what was going on. Because when I wrote this, um, when I have this in my in the actual implementation, uh, it's flawless. So it's like, how can it be flawless there and not flawless here? Well, here's your answer. The answer is, is that when I retyped this for demonstration purposes, I mistakenly used an equal sign instead of a minus sign. And what that shows is that the development tools cannot identify those types of errors. After all these years, these development tools, year after year, they, they are not at a level where they're going to pinpoint that out. Now, maybe a Copilot, if I was using Copilot, I've never used a Copilot in Visual Studio, and I don't plan on doing so. Now, one day I may end up in a software development job where Copilot is required for that. I'm like, okay, cool. But for what I do in my own development, um, I don't use uh, Copilot. So, but anyway, um, I ran the program with the modification. This is version 7, my version. And um, as we see, it's um, perfect. So, <coughs> it may have taken me two or three days to make this version, version 7, with no assistance from AI or anything like that, using my own mind. Because I just wanted to do something different. And I was able to come up with something different than what AI was able to produce. And I didn't ask ChatGPT about my solution for a couple of reasons. Number one, I have grown aware that when you ask ChatGPT something, when you pose a query you're giving that information to OpenAI Incorporated. And I sometimes feel like if their AI is the real deal, then it needs to grow up without my help. Sometimes. It needs to grow up, grow up without our help. It has uh, gotten ahead by sucking in all this data from the internet in order to um, come up with something that approximates the ability to answer almost any question. But it can't do things that it has no model for. And I don't even know what model in me allowed me and my real intelligence, my RI, to exceed the quality level of AI. The only thing I can say is my life experience in software development and other areas of life has given me a level of ability that exceeds at least the stylistic and design abilities in terms of being able to design software, design product, design solutions that exceed a so-called AI that only can mechanically transcribe and use formulas to transcribe input text based off of other text from a database where the database is of a fixed um, of a fixed nature. Its parameters are more fixed than mine are. I am truly dynamic as a living being. So, <clears throat> but that's not to uh, talk down or throw shade at this tool that we call. AI, it's just that, um, you know, um, that's just the reality. And the sooner that you realize that, the sooner you can just move on and no longer be enamored with um, a tool that has been over-marketed and over-hyped. So, um, but what I do want to do is I want to put my solution and... Um, chat GPT's best solution side by side and look at it. So once again, this code at this time on um, May uh, 30th, 2024 only exists on my computer 
or computers and this video. It doesn't exist in any Git, Git repository on the internet, nor any blog posts. I'm still deciding how I'm going to approach that because I've become aware that as if I if I contribute data to the internet, I'm essentially training AI. And I'm not opposed to that, but it's like it's it's not actually a good idea to have an advanced tool out there in or let me say it this way. You see the difference between these two codes? They couldn't, they're similar. They're almost they're almost the same, but mine is just on the right side, my, on the right side of the screen, mine is just that much more different than what you see on the left side. And it's like, why would you have something set up that if junior programmers use it and ChatGPT is the gateway for them to use it? To such an extent where they have a false sense of accomplishment that if they ever dig themselves into a hole that it is much harder to get out of that hole than it would be if they made the error themselves. Because at least they have these psychological foundations, the sequential foundations, right? You have the sequential foundations at each step of advancement in tweaking solutions from one version to another, micro version to another, that you know how to backtrack and resolve the discrepancies between the um, working the the per, the uh, working state you were at, where things were working well, and where things fell apart. You could you could solve the discrepancy, but if AI starts using increasingly more advanced codes from other senior programmers and master programmers, right? And junior programmers start using this stuff. They're, they're not going to um, have a, a chance in actually self-developing themselves to a senior or master level in terms of actual knowledge and most importantly, ability. So that's why I'm, I am I am still contemplating how I'm going to continue to disclose these type of codes <coughs> in the face of AI. So, but anyway, um, but I like what I did on on the right hand side of the screen. Um, this is very much what I wanted to do. Um, there are some concessions I had to make. Um, the if the first if else, that's kind of a concession. Um, I may evolve this at some point. It's not a priority, so it may actually never happen. But I would find a way to actually collapse that if else um, that I have there into um, the second um, if statement. Right? There may be a boolean variable that I could develop that. And, and let me just note, ternary operators do not count. I personally count ternary operators as the same as an if-else. So I, I am not talking about that at all. So no ternary operators as a solution. I'm not talking about the way it looks. Well, I am, but not so much. I'm talking about the actual definition of the the uh, solution, how it's actually defined, right? And if it's defined well, then it's if it's defined really well, then it will naturally have the right aesthetic treatment in terms of how the code uh, is put together. But I like this version a lot. It's one of the best codes that I feel I've written, you know, and I like that I can use it portably. In different languages, right? And I think that's also where we also need to have a more enlightened view of what we call um, intellectual property. We need programmers to be able to have programming toolkits, their own codes that they can use from job to job as part of their master toolkit. It's kind of like when you have a carpenter that works on different houses right? 
they got their own special toolkit, their own special, um, you know, process and approach. And they, they can train other uh, up and coming apprentices and carpenters on that. Right. And it allows the building trades to go forward and, you know, um, develop in a way that's beneficial to society. And I think programmers um, should um, have that um, latitude as well, right, um, on certain things. So I created this privately and independently, right, and it's a great thing. There was no uh, actual constraints on this. Um, I did use it for some uh, real serious purpose that I had, but um, at the same time, it was an optional thing for me to do. So that allowed me to fold into a level of expressivity and creativity um, with this that um, I seldom see, um, you know, in other situations. So I had this redone in C++ because, number one, I actually wanted my I originally wanted to implement this in, in Linux in C++. But I wanted to start out with a Microsoft environment just so that, um, you know, it's familiar. But also, I have some other plans in that environment as well. But I wanted to do this in C++, in, uh, C++ and in Linux um, originally. But in this case, I also want to do it um, as a second step because I want to validate my idea my idea that the code is portable, the core piece of code is portable to another platform and another programming language. So I go from C Sharp to C++. They're different. But because I've used C++ for nearly 10 years, I am um, read up enough on it and experienced enough on it that um, I can navigate that And so um, there are some small tweaks that have to be made. There is no string join function in the standard library that's going to um, uh, give you tabs like that. At least I haven't um, encountered one yet. There's all kinds of uh, techniques you could use that could uh, simulate that. And you could could manufacture a string join uh, function. It would be kind of cool. But I would I would rather like the STL pros to to do that. When I use C++, I don't use it as a systems programmer. I use it as an applications programmer. So and I'm I'm totally fine with that. And so the first thing I need to do is compile this program, right? So I need to set about getting that done. So I go through a couple options here. Trying to, I've actually tried to compile it earlier, and uh, I ran into some snags, right? And one of them was I I used the wrong, um, um, I used GCC the wrong way. I used it the uh, long way, as I call it. I call it the long way, and I I went the long way the wrong way, which is fine. I had taken a break from uh, writing C plus plus for a couple of months, and so. And I've gotten so used to my build tools because I have, I actually have build tools for doing C++ and Linux. And I decided not to use those build tools in this case because I wanted to keep the example simple and approachable. And so I decided to just do a raw compile on the command line. And my, my first attempt at that was, um, my first couple of attempts at that was not successful so I just needed to jog my memory a little bit. Uh, but GCC dash dash standard equals C plus plus seventeen dash O and then whatever the file name is that you want to output and then the actual input uh, file or files. Um, you know, that's great if it's a if it's if the source code is a C source code, okay. It's actually not the right way because you know um, even with standard C++, I mean, you're just, you're missing all kinds of other things. You're missing the incorporation of the STL and all this other stuff, right? So that's what this error is all about. 
So the shortcut way to do it and the way to do it that is going to require the least amount of work is to use G++ instead of GCC. So when you use G++, then it has all the right defaults built into it and you're able to um, uh, get accomplished what you need accomplished. So um, I need to set about doing that. But I was sitting here looking at this um, because I, I know what all this is. But a lot of I, there are people I hear. I hear that many people are intimidated by the error messages from C++ compiler. But I don't know what they're talking about because to me, the output is very straightforward. Again, this is the same PDF file, but on Linux, right? Using um, a PDF viewer um, on on Linux, right? So, document viewer. There's that that letter A. I was expecting page one. So, at least a PDF standard is consistent across platforms. Whether you're talking about Windows, Mac, or Linux, got the same quirks uh, for the most part. So. I'm going to have the C++ program uh, translate that PDF file uh, to text and then convert the information there, the, the text output, to tabs. So, um, and there are, there are um, similar ways of doing the things that you do in Microsoft.net. Um, you can do those in the realm of C++ and the standard template library, the STO. And so, you know, so that's not a, not a big deal as much as it was, let's say, five or ten years ago. That was more of a big deal. But Bajar Straustrup and team, the community at large, have um, put in quite a bit of work to um, improve uh, matters considerably. And so... I appreciate that. And as we get ready to wrap up here, because we're drawing to the near the end of this conversation, it's like, why do you use C++? Well, I use C++ because I want to build applications on Linux for the applications that I want to build. And those applications tend to be graphical user interfaces. And while I could use Python for that, I don't believe that Python is a stable platform. And I can hear the chorus, because I, I spent a lot of years on Quora, so I'm used to the debates about the programming language. I can hear all the Python developers out there like, hey, no, no, did you think about the bubble? I know, I heard all the counter. But when you think about how Python evolves and how JavaScript evolves, many of these languages, including C Sharp, they evolve in such a way where if you try to keep pace with either the language standard or the community, um, you will be forever rewriting your programs. And then you're going to reach a point where if you decide you want to get off that treadmill, then all of a sudden your program has a dependency on an older version of Python, an older version of JavaScript, etc. It's like, then your program starts looking outdated or then it starts getting deprecated in the repositories. Nobody wants to deploy your stuff anymore. People are hesitant to install your program now because it's using an older version of the language or runtime or whatever. That's the future of Python because that's been the past in Python. Whereas C++ is much more um, ambitious now in its evolution but it's been designed by a much more rigorous process and dare I say a rigorous uh, group of individuals that are able to advance the language while at the same time keep it on balance with everything that has been part of C++ for the previous like 30 years. <coughs> so 
that's that's my argument for sticking with C++. It's it I you know you're not going to do rapid development with it like you're not going to spin up a applicate a full on GUI application with C++ like that just like that, you know, unless you want them hardcore KDE developers or GTK developers, right? But you're at least going to be able to build an application once you finish it that has great performance. If you do it right, it's going to have better performance than any equivalent Python program. It's going to um, potentially have better visuals if you do it right. And so there are many reasons to go that route. So thank you for um, going through this process with me. And you've probably noticed how fast that C++ program was when I ran it. And all I have to say is this has been very um, revealing to me as far as the potential for uh, AI, which I see as still useful for certain things, but it is not something that I find to be substantially useful for software development when we the more advanced the solution, the less useful. Well, okay, let me not say less useful. Let me be more precise. AI is not useful for more advanced software development. It's not, AI, as they call it, it is not useful for advanced software development. It is, it is something that the models are trained off of the example code on the internet. And you may also have some access to Git repositories. But it doesn't understand those Git repositories. It actually doesn't. Only thing it's going to understand is the textual def- the textual descriptions provided on Stack Overflow in blogs. And, you know, that's the only chance that it has. But in general, blogs and uh, chat forums like um, Stack Overflow and Reddit, um, they're not sufficient. They don't, they're not, uh, they don't have a sufficient amount of advanced codes and advanced completed solutions that are explained. And so the AI just will never get there. So that's why no one has anything to worry about. The only thing you have to worry about in the near future, in the short term, is just uh, the force of marketing. The, 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 the push of sales to really push this out as a replacement. And by the time people find out that it doesn't go far enough, then those that you are competing against as a company, as a business, as organizations, who have doubled down on actual tangible people and advanced minds and skill sets, they're going to overtake, overtake you. They're going to, you know, move ahead to the next stage, and that's how it's going to be. So, anyway, um, that's kind of that is my take on um, programming and AI, and I hope I proved my case. Well, I don't hope I. I know I did, but. You know, I hope you understand what I was talking about here. And if you want to continue this conversation some more, then feel free to send me a comment and we will we will chat it up. I'll see you.